it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 158 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too, don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? We're stuck on repeat because we're drinking the Kenyan coffee again because I love that caramel. Oh, you do. And where can everybody find it? Bantamroasters.com. And use the code FLUFFYBUTT for 10% off anything on the website and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some of this absolutely delicious Kenyan coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Okay, so we're in December. How are you doing? Fa la 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 la. You're fa la 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 ling all around. Mm Mm-hmm. And planning for chickens in the spring. Yes, but we're still keeping our breeds a secret. Can we talk about one thing that I'm getting? No. Oh, man. You just shot me down in water. (laughs) Wham. You should have seen her face. The studio just flamed. We cannot. We cannot. It's Christmas time. We have to wait till after the holiday. But it has to do with Christmas. No, we can't. Can I even talk about it next episode? Maybe. We'll think about it. Oh, my God. (laughs) I'm going to have to go rogue on you. (laughs) No, no. You can't go rogue. I can go rogue. It could happen. Man, I can't believe we're in December already. 2023 has been an interesting year in a lot of ways. To say the least. To say the least. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're still doing our thing every day, working this podcast. We love it. We've had a lot of first-year chicken keepers reaching out to us lately, you know, coming up with some problems. Right. And we've helped some people through some, I mean, it wasn't major stuff, but, you know, when you're- Some are. Some Some are major. Yeah, some are major. It's true. I should have said most of them had good endings is what I should have said. Yes. But just remember when you were a new chicken person and it was terrifying to not know what to do. We were talking about that the other day because you never know if you're that person that's going to get a surprise phone call from me. If you call, if you're- (laughs) Wait, I get them every day. You get them all the time. But if you're a person who's in need of help and you're messaging us, sometimes it's too much for me to write. And your Instagram will start to ring and it will be me on the other end. And everyone's so surprised when it's me on the other end. But so it's much easier to talk to somebody at that point. So, yeah, we've had a lot of people have some problems. You can message us anytime. We're always here for you any way you like. You can email us. You can DM us. Anything that if you need to get in touch with us, if we are available, we will get back to you. I'm glad you said that because I feel like over the past couple months, I've probably let some emails fall through the cracks. So I want to tell people, if you have emailed us and I have not gotten back to you in, say, a week, email again. Do not be afraid you're bothering us. It probably means- Just scream, Holly Ann, answer the email. Like you might have ended up in a spam folder or I just might have gotten like three pages worth of email and, you know, I'm human. I'm human. Sorry, but I am. Yeah, but we really do try to get to everybody. And like I said... So don't be shy. Reach If you don't hear back from us, reach out again. We really will help you. Definitely. And if you work in an animal hospital around the country, you may be receiving a call from me because we do call different animal hospitals around the entire country to find people veterinarians. It just became easier to do it that way. Yes. So you know what? If you work in one and you hear somebody call and say, I'm looking for a chicken vet for my friend, it may be us. Could be. It could be us. So yeah, I'm getting ready to get the chicken tree out. Deck the halls. Yes. I'm graduating to a bigger Christmas tree this year for the chicken tree. I think we are as well. 
Although ours is probably going to lean a little more farmy than just chicken. Well, and the tree itself is going to look farmy, like a handmade like garland mm-hmm. for it out of twine and stuff like that. But my chicken ornaments have exploded past the tree that they were on. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you too. So I need a bigger tree to showcase them all mm-hmm. a little bit better. So that's going to be going up soon. And I am in desperate need of Christmas shopping, man. Oh my God. Well, I've been doing a lot of shopping. Yes, I have not. Mm. I am so far behind. Usually I'm the one that's far behind. No, I am so far behind. Mm. You could just tell me I'm just going to give you an eBay Christmas card this year. Go ahead. Get it on eBay. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I just might. You never know. What, can I talk about the one thing that I'm getting? No, 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 no. Dude, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm also right. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to pop that. I'm going to pop that balloon. <laughs> Well, on oh, that wait, note, wait, I'm wait give you on a little, that note. <laughs> no, I'll give you a little, I'm going to give you a little hint. No, no <laughs> hint. <laughs> Hong Kong. No, it's top secret. <laughs> Holly Ann. Okay, well, on that note, Honk. if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, Honk. head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. Believe it or not, those do amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there... If you want to do something else to help us out, hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. And we really do grow with subscriptions. If you're looking for other ways to help support the podcast, you can tell a few chicken-loving friends about the show. A zillion. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can check out our Etsy shop. We've got t-shirts. We've got mugs. We've got tiny chickens. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. We have an amazing group of patrons, and we have great monthly happy hours with them. They're so much fun. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website and our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah? Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chicken? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Boo, boo, boot it, boot it, yeah. It's time for the breed spotlight, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're incorporating the name of the breed into your... Well, Yeah. Okay. It's the Booted Bantam. The Booted Bantam, also known as the Sable Poot. This week's Breed Spotlight, here we go. These adorable little birds are true bantams that originated in Asia several hundred years ago, but they were further developed and bred in Europe. They look very much like the Belgian Duclay, but they're a tiny bit larger and they have no muffs or beards. Clean face. They look a lot like the Belgian Duclay. They do. So this year in 2023, Mm -hmm. the booted bantam, along with the Belgian Duclay and the Japanese bantam, 
were added to the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list in the critically endangered category. Boo and hiss. That is not good. We tend to think of these little birds as simply companions or show birds, but they're also very important keepers of true bantam genetics. One thing I realized with going to Ohio last month is how much the bantam is part of the show world. Very much so. I mean, when you go through the bantam aisles, it's forever bantams. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would have to say the majority of the chickens in that show are bantams. Absolutely. And call ducks, which is essentially a bantam, a bantam duck. bantam duck. Yeah. So to hear that there's one that's in critically or multiple that are critically endangered is sad well, and me, it's alarming. We did see some duclays, although not tons and tons. But let me ask you this. Did you see any booted bantams? No, I did not. Mm-mm. Did you? Uh, not that I no, not that I noticed. I can't no. remember seeing them. We did see Belgian duclays because you kept taking pictures and sending them to Pete so that Rambo could have a girlfriend. Rambo needs a girlfriend. So, but no, I did not see them. And you know what? It's sad because they are different. There's no beard. There's no moth. Right. The funny thing there is that once you've been at that show and doing breed history the way we have for the past several years, you realize that there are fashions. We've talked about this. Chickens in fashion and not in fashion. Oh, yeah. And so when we went, I expected to see a bunch of certain breeds that weren't there. But then there were things like- a New lot Hampshire of, Bantam. Well, there are a ton of New Hampshire Bantams. And there were a ton of Old English, and I'm sure they're always there. So many Old English. But Sultans. There were a bunch of Sultans there. Mm-hmm. I did not expect to see Sultans. The Sumatras. A the bunch phoenix, of them. There were a lot of phoenix. The phoenix were beautiful. Yeah. The but then there were some that were non-existent. Right. And, you know, I could not even think about looking at the well summers because of Gertie, but there was only one well summer in the yeah. whole place. There I mean, there were some that you would think that would be there a lot that weren't. Well, Buckeyes. It's Ohio, and there were only three Buckeyes. We were talking about that a lot. Like, where are the Buckeyes? Yeah. This is Ohio. It was fascinating. All of this to say... It sounds like the Buddha Bantam is not really in fashion right now, and we'd like to change that. Yes, they're so adorable. Also known as sable poots, just because I like to say sable poot, Buddha Bantams were developed in the Netherlands, Germany, and the UK. They've been in the US for a long time as well. They first appeared in the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1879, and they're found in the feather-legged Bantam class. They got lots of feather legs. Lots of feathers. According to the Belgian Duclay and Booted Bantam Club of the U.S., the first Booted Bantams were brought to Holland, now the Netherlands, in the 1600s, probably from China or Burma. Some sources say that the Booted Bantam was a foundation breed for the Belgian Duclay, and while I could not find anything to confirm this, it does seem very likely. All you got to do is look at them exactly. and you can yeah, see that. Very I mean, the sad part is 1600. We can't let this chicken go. It's no. been in existence since 1600. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We got to help it. The good Reverend Edmund Dixon, writing in 1850s England, declared that the booted bantams were all but extinct in the UK. So they were popular. They went out of popularity again. But by the turn of the 20th century, the fancier bantams were definitely growing in popularity again in both the US, the UK, and the rest of Europe. And we think some of this is the fact that chicken shows were growing in popularity and they were largely responsible for this return to some of the highly ornamental breeds. You can see how a chicken show would do that because with people there, you have a great interest in chickens. Mm -hmm. You're walking around, you're looking at 10,000 plus chickens. Right. And it does show you different ones that may interest you more than others. Yes. And well, first you're going with your sense of of sight, right? Mm -hmm. That you like the look of them. Then you can do research and see if they would fit into your flock or not. But yeah, chicken shows are definitely a way to get the chickens in a more popular spot. That's for sure. Yeah. Now, Lewis Wright felt that the fanciers of the late 19th and early 20th century were mixing in too much Pekin. In the U.S., that's Bantam Cochin. They were mixing in too much Pekin genetics to make even more heavily feathered feet and legs, Hmm. if such a thing is possible. No, I don't think it's possible. But I will say that the breed standards would have helped to get this trend under control. Right. I was going to say, I don't see the bantam cochin in them at all, except for the legs and feet. I don't either. Their bodies are very different. The bodies are different. The heads are different. Everything's different. The, tail, the comb and waddles are different. The tail might be a little similar, but no, I don't. Yeah, I agree so with you. So the only thing that they brought in were the feathered legs and feet. That's it. Probably. Well, like we said earlier, their faces are clean. No beards or muffs. We talk about their feathery legs and feet and where that came from. Now, they also have a moderately sized straight comb and waddles with red ear lobes. 
So what does that tell us? Mm-hmm. The sable poot apparently means saber, saber leg. Saber, saber like leg. the sword. Oh, like a saber leg. Okay. Right. It's a reference to the long curving leg and foot feathers. So saber leg. Oh. Right? Okay, cool. Okay, very I military. See I see it. Mm-hmm. So they do have those vulture hawks, which the Cochin have also. Yeah. So it's the stronger feathers on the legs and feet. Yeah. Not just Right. And you get these stiff legs. They're stiff, man. These stiff feathers that grow out the back of the legs, and they do make them look even more feathery. They do. I mean, it's not like a normal feather. It's like an industrial right. feather. When, when you've seen it or felt it, you will know what we're talking about. Yeah. So they have a wide tail, carry it high. So depending on the age, sex, et cetera, Weight ranges from one pound four ounces to one pound ten ounces. That is a very tiny little the, bird. The true bantams do tend to be the smaller birds. Oh yeah. Now they come in several beautiful colors. The most popular, the male floor. Absolutely, and that's not just the U.S. That's all of Europe, essentially. I think that's like a most popular around the world. Everywhere you go, mm-hmm. that color everyone it's beautiful. loves. It's beautiful. They're beautiful. Okay, so the APA notes that this was the original color imported to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a fun fact. Yes. That's a little fun fact. Okay, so they're listed in the APA standard of perfection in five colors. Let's go ahead and name them. There's white. The milliflor. The porcelain. The black. And the self blue. The American Bantam Association has several more accepted colors, including the buff. The golden neck. The gray. The mottled. And in the U.K., the breed is arguably more popular than in the U.S., and there are even more beautiful colors. We get to list these colors full tomorrow. Right? Lavender. Gold. Silver. Lemon. Buff white. And the porcelain milliflor, which I love. The cuckoo, it's going on still. Gold and silver birchen. And black and lavender mottled. I think I would get the black and lavender mottled. There's also a rumpless version of the booted bantam. And they originated in a forest town in Germany, which I'm going to visit. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. I'm going there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go visit the rumpless booted bantam. You're going to wear a dirndl? (laughs) I I don't know, something (laughs) German. (laughs) Give me a big, big thing of beer. Stout. Mm, Papa. (laughs) And a booted bantam with rumpless. Beer beer is the theme of the evening. (laughs) It's the theme of the evening. These little hens lay around two white to cream eggs per week. They're not the best layers. No, I will maintain my stance that nankins are the best of the true bantam layers. Yeah. But that being said, you know, if you just want a few extra eggs, two eggs a week and you have four or five bantams, it's okay. Now, if you need them to sit on some eggs, they will for you. They do go broody. Uh, They are a bantam. Yeah, exactly. The only bantam that we found that really wasn't a broody type were the Seabrights. Yeah, and you lambasted Sir John Seabright for that one. Uh, yes, I did. He yes, took that oh, broodiness yes, right on out of there, <laughs> didn't he? Sir John, gosh darn it. So we said at the start of the spotlight, the Buddha Bantams make great show birds and fantastic companions. And that's true. Like every single chicken, basically. The true Bantams tend to be very tame and friendly if you handle them regularly from the time they're chicks, unless they're Rambo. Don't count out these little birds as completely impractical, though. I do think they have some really good things about them. I mean, here's the thing. If you have a small space, bantams are the way to go because if this chicken only lays two eggs a week and you have a family of four and you have a mid-size or a small size place, mm-hmm. you can get double the bantams. Yeah, so if you had five or six bantams. It would be laying. the same of having two chickens or three chickens. Except their eggs are smaller, but still. But still, you you're gonna work. It's gonna feed your family of four. They no do doubt. offer some food security as well as being beautiful and a lot of fun. They also make great additions to mixed bantam flocks. Yes, which I'm gonna be getting my bantam flock. At I some know point. you are. Well, if you have a spare Japanese bantam, throw them my way. I'm not throwing any bantam your way. I'm keeping them all. Greedy. <laughs> <laughs> so the Buddha bantam can fly. So you want them in a run with a top, that is an excellent idea, or else you're going to have critically endangered birds roosting in trees. Because they're little, they can fly. Rambo can fly really well. Well, they're little. That's They can. Yeah. I mean, now you're not going to see a giant Buff Orpington trying to fly <laughs> up into a tree. There's an image. And if you do, get that on video because that's going to go viral on Instagram. They're heavy feathering, and they are very heavily feathered. Their heavy feathering means that they do need some heat relief in hot weather. We learned this the hard way. They do feel the heat. And their tiny bodies also require help in frigid weather, because remember how small they are. They're tiny. Plus, that straight comb needs some protection. So 
At my place, Pete and I equip all of our Bantam coops with panel heaters to ward off frostbite and hypothermia. Because remember, less than two pounds. Well, I feel like if you can't do that in your coop for Bantams, they need to come into a garage or something mm-hmm. where you can in the winter for yeah. to sleep only. Right. And then go back out. Right, right. Because, I mean, less than two pounds, that body, it can't sustain that no. amount of cold. And not to mention, you know, the comb and waddles being straight comb, that needs right. protection too. But they're so tiny, they do need some of our assistance. They absolutely do. Now, remember, they have heavily feathered feet and legs, as we've said about 10 times in the spotlight. You want to try to keep them clear of ice and snow, you know, that'll build up on the feathers. You don't want that happening. Nope. You don't want them cold, muddy feet that are going to freeze because they can get frostbite on those toes. Oh, yeah. Frostbite in any bird is bad, but frostbite in a feathered toe bird, Mm. that's got to be terrible to keep clean and... Yeah. It just sounds like a nightmare. It's like having bumblefoot on a feathered foot bird, like ivy on yeah. a toe. Yeah. Not fun. During a foot that's molting. That was not yeah. fun. Yeah. That's no. Try to avoid that at all costs if you can. Yes. You should. Okay. Where do we get them? I would start with the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory, but the breed clubs are also an excellent place to visit. Both the US and UK breed clubs keep breeders lists, and we linked both clubs in our show notes. In the U.S., some of the large hatcheries do carry them. As always, Google is your friend. Put in your buyer zip code. Buyer beware, though. Please beware. Absolutely, buyer beware. If you're buying chicks, expect them to be straight run. This is a breed that I would absolutely get vaccinated. So checking out the hatcheries is not a bad idea. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So we know where we're going to go with this. If you have the booted bantam, send us some pictures. We would love to see them. Sable poot. <laughs> mention us in your story and then that way I can reshare your story after we look at them and enjoy them right onto our stories. We love to see your birds. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. They're back with an innovative new product. You're going to want to check this out. It's an extra large set, a 14-pound feeder and three-gallon water with steep anti-roost lids. They're made of super durable material. You can either stand them on legs or hang them on brackets on your coop or fence. They're easy to remove and clean too. Plus, they look awesome. We personally use Roosties and we're huge fans. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, check out the Roosties store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Are we ready to move on to... Main topic, yeah. Yeah. This week we have a fantastic interview for you. Our guests are Paul and Kirsty. Paul is the co-founder of EcoNourish, and Kirsty is the marketing manager. They're going to tell us their stories and the stories of this really fascinating business. So much fun. Enjoy. Today we have the privilege of talking with Paul Cartwright, who is the co-founder of EcoNourish. And Kirsty Barnden, who is the marketing manager with Eco Nourish, you two are currently working with a product that chicken keepers everywhere will want to hear about. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for having us. Really happy. Yeah, happy to be here, guys. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. I'm excited about <laughs> this. I'm wishing we could find a way to get this to the U.S. You never We've know. We've got to figure this out. You never know. Oh, we're yeah. just not allowed. <laughs> it's right. I think at, right now, our overarching conversation, obviously, all of our UK listeners are going to be thrilled to hear this. Um, but I think for our US audience and the rest of the world, what we're going to be talking about is the overarching needs of chickens and how your product is really, I'm going to say a game changer, not just for, you know, normal, healthy chickens every day, but for special needs chickens, for aging chickens. Game changer for the UK. Yeah, it really is. Completely, because they have been in kind of a desert, a dead zone Mm -hmm. for their birds to get get things like this. 
And now it's opening up. It's a brand new door opening. Yeah. And it's so exciting. So, so exciting. Here's what we're going to do. Paul, in a few minutes, we're going to come back to you since you're the co-founder and we're going to get your story and the story of this product. And everybody, it's fascinating. Yes. But Kirsty, you're the marketing and content manager. So I'm going to hand it to you. You take a minute or two and sell us on this product. Tell us about EcoNourish. You want like the elevator pitch? For- yes, please. <laughs> yep. Exactly right. Okay. I think you are totally right when you say it's a game changer for the UK market because there's a great deal of controversy about insect feeding in the UK because of DEFRA regulations. And people believe that you can't feed insects to chickens right and they're right in that you can't feed processed or dried insects to chickens but what we do at eco nourish is distribute live black soldier fly larvae through our e-commerce website and we're the first direct farm to consumer supplier who's dedicated to the chicken market so Live black soldier fly larvae have been fed in agricultural settings, um, in in commercial chicken farms for about five years and more commonly in the last two years as a way to kind of drive the industry towards net zero and be more sustainable and also for the health benefits. But it's not been available to the domestic keeper. But Paul spotted a gap in the market and the fact that they were so beneficial for chickens and realised that people needed a a dedicated supplier and a direct and easy way to get access to them. So people order them on the website and we post them out through Royal Mail, who are the only courier service who will deliver living products in really nice tubes with the lid. And then they arrive at people's doorsteps. It's probably the, the weirdest item people have ever received in the post getting a tube full of wriggling creatures so it's create we've had some feedback that people's people's husbands have gone what have you ordered from amazon now this is the weirdest thing that's ever arrived at our house but um other than that feedback the feedback has been truly incredible beyond our expectations and people absolutely love it and as you've touched on about you know the needs of um, sick hens. That's what's really come to light in terms of the feedback that we've had and some incredible stories that we just weren't expecting of hens who have been tempted to eat again by the larvae and, and then through nourishing themselves have recovered. And it's not what we were expecting to hear. We knew there were going to be health benefits, but yeah, it's, it's been an astounding reception that's you know I, th- I think that's the biggest the biggest surprise we've had. We knew how the people would love them. We didn't realise that we would have this like team of super fans so quickly on like social media. And I, I've I've never worked with a company before where they've built that following like a cult following <laughs> so quickly. It's it's also changed kind of the conversations that people have been having on social media and you know whereas before if anyone would mention the you know feeding insects people would go it's against the law it's against defra regulations you can't do that that's illegal but now people are actually having conversations saying well live insect feeding actually isn't illegal and it's completely defra approved and it's okay and they're having discussions about how they can get insects into their into their chickens diets which i think is really exciting and that's been a really quick change that we've noticed since june until now wow that's amazing now we're gonna get into the meat of all the detail (laughs) of them in a little while but first i want to throw it back to paul and i we want to know about you you're a co-founder of this company yeah we want to know your background we want to know what you've done and what gave you the inspiration to come up with us Great. Thanks, guys. So so good to to be able to talk to you and, and share a bit of where we came from. It's been quite a journey. I live in the UK, just outside London. 
but previously, I mean, I was born and brought up in on a farm in Zambia, uh, in central Southern Africa. And that's, you know, there's a great childhood to have. And and what that does is it, it develops in anyone who does that a, a deep compassion for animals. It just, you can't help but do that. Um, so I've lived around animals in my life. And I, I did my education down in South Africa, came back to Zambia um, and came back to the farm and started a chicken operation business, um, a broiler business, which I grew and then, and then sold. And that sort of took me into what I referred to my previous life. Uh, and then I ended up here in UK for various reasons. And I was working as an agriculture economist. I was working for a fund that was developing projects back out in Zambia. So it's fantastic. I could go back out to what essentially was my home country and had great work. We were working with developing smallholder agriculture in Zambia, small farmers giving them access to irrigation. So that was a that was a fantastic position and and um, privileged to be able to work in that environment again. Um, did that for 10 years and then thought about I would really like to work for myself again. And that's always in the back of your mind. You know, when you come from the background of running your own business and the satisfaction and the the hardship of it, but but definitely the rewards are so great in, in so many aspects. So I started looking around what I could do here in the UK to work for myself. And being farming background, farming is a real challenging business in, in the UK, as it is all over the world. So I had a hard look at it. But I'd started to read about this whole new concept of insect for feed in terms of being a source of protein for stock feed. And I I liked a couple of things about it. You could do this type of farming in a very small area, small footprint, very low use of water and other natural resources, but you could develop and produce an incredibly quality protein and something that was sustainable, had huge eco credibility, you're upscaling waste pre-consumer waste, basically, into protein. Uh, and I thought, well, it doesn't get much better than that. And I started to read about more about the black soldier fly, and that was a particular in insect. There are others, but it's a particular one for various reasons of they are an incredible little animal. And the more you learn about them and having had the privilege to work with them so closely now, uh, they are incredible animals. And it's, that sort of drives and develops a passion just through what you can see, what they can achieve in, in their very short life cycles. So I had a good look at that. And starting a business is, as we all know, is challenging. But and in the UK, even more so. But I think I spent a lot of time looking at it. I actually had a shed in my garden. So I started growing a little small colony that I just to see if I could do that and see what they were about. And and that grabbed me. And that was the, the anchor that said, right, this is something I'd really love to do. Could I find a commercial application for it? And the industry is growing very quickly worldwide. It's huge, obviously, in the US, Australia, and Europe, and the UK now. And we have some big operators going commercial and the source of protein for stock feed. And that was always where the growth potential was. It's not something that I wanted to do in my stage of life. I didn't want to look at something in terms of it's all about the business developing and driving a huge commodity type product. I wanted to look at something more niche. So, you know, the wonderful thing about black soldier fly larvae is that the growing process also produces a couple of byproducts from that um, through the frass and the growing medium that you have, uh, that you're producing them from. So I looked at all that, but I'm an economist, so an ag economist. So I, I did the numbers and like every business, a lot of it's driven by volume and, and, and pricing. And I didn't want to go down that route. So I had to see and look at, was there another way that I could do it? So I started looking at how we could most efficiently grow the larvae and breed them and grow them up. And through that whole process, and I started this around 2018. So it's it's been a four or five year learning curve to really understand them, grow them in a way that um, we developed a, a, an automated process ourselves, which we have a patent for, and doing it slightly differently. And being able to do it on a smaller scale, um, but be able to produce a really high quality product, premium product that's going to benefit the end user. And I hadn't, the realization about domestic owner market was as big as it was in the UK. COVID had a lot to do with that, it increased right. almost 50% in that period of two years of COVID. So, and that came up and I thought, wow, now there is something that hasn't been exposed to it. And the whole world has been talking about, you know, a source of protein, which it is. It's fantastic processed protein with the whole story about direct replacement for fish meal and soya. And we all know the story about how the sustainability of insects so much 
better in terms of use of world resources and protecting the world's environment. So so that really grabbed me. I thought, right, here's an opportunity. E-commerce is something I've never done before. So it's not the type of market that I was familiar with, but I certainly saw this as an opportunity. It, it was a market that wasn't being serviced. And I knew that hen owners, domestic hen owners, are hugely passionate about their hens. And, and you're you're right. There's a ton in the UK. Yes. Hen keeping in the UK is, I mean, so many of our friends live in the UK and um, it's all about hen keeping and keeping those chickens. What's the statistic? Are they the fourth or third most popular pet Jane, in the UK? Jane the fourth. Telling us the fourth? Four. It's the fourth most popular pet. So there's 1.4 1. Right. 1 million <clears throat> domestic poultry in the UK now. And that right. I don't know if it was the same for you guys over in the US, but COVID was a huge catalyst yes. for that change because people were at home so much more right. and they were looking for more kind of connections to nature and like, mm. you know, real projects to get their teeth into. And, we, and that's when chicken keeping took off. Yeah. And we right. have been feeling so bad for our UK friends because we've been getting the benefit of the soldier fly grub over here for a much longer time. So it's right. nice that now they will start to see the benefit of this tiny insect that can do so many good things. And it's genius anyway, because they are, I mean, all of the sustainability you mentioned, the low environmental impact of, of growing and farming and them. And the environment. And honestly, the most exciting part to me is that they are a natural part of your hen's diet already. You're just right. finding a way to give them an excellent quality insect. What I find really interesting and I want to circle back to is your time as a child on a farm in Zambia In Zambia, because I feel like that starts that connection right there to the animals, to the chickens and wanting to do business and do something that's going to be so beneficial for these animals. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was a a great childhood. Anyone who comes from Africa will will know what I'm talking about. It's it's an incredible, incredibly free. I had a life where I left the house in the morning, and I came back for dinner in the evening, and I had a completely free life to do and learn the things that that I am so appreciative now, having been exposed to that. So that that was fantastic, and I, you know, we had a very close family, and we had a a, a mixed farming enterprise doing cattle and dairy. And chickens as well. And everybody had a few layers in the garden for your source of eggs. We also had um, we had a, a very mixed breed, and I wouldn't even be able to tell you what they were. <laughs> um, they were a colourful bunch of bantams. So, and they were, you know, having them always outside the back door, having them always and the noise and and the cockerels. I mean, it was just a part of life, and it was something that we took for granted. And I, I really appreciate that. And I, I feel sorry for people who don't have a childhood like that. So that was an incredibly rich childhood and, and been exposed to all that beauty of, of being able to raise and, and be close to animals and pets and everything else was fantastic. You know, you so, were telling you know, us before we started the interview about predators over there and how really they couldn't you couldn't do free ranging because there was a broader spectrum, as anybody can imagine, of predators for the chickens. So did, did you have like a big run or an aviary for them? It was easier for on my commercial farming side on on the broiler birds. Um, that was harder to do free range because they, you know, we have those spread out. The houses were spread out, and we're in a very rural area, right. so um, the bushes we call it. So the, the the birds around the house would certainly know. At night, they would always roost. Uh, um, they learn very quickly about, and, and as birds naturally do. But that was really important in this case. And yes, we there are predators, uh, small and large. That was always a risk. It became a part of life, though. It's something you had to deal with. We mm -hmm. didn't really close them all up. And I, in a way, that was it was just part of nature. They they took their chances. And we did lose, you know, we did lose hens and uh, some of our bantams, two predators. But being close to the house, they knew where the safe spots were. They, they were smart enough. Chickens chickens have that incredible sense of of preservation. So they were good at that. On the bro on the commercial side, we just couldn't do that for the very reason. We'd be decimated. You know, it would just, no, you know, yeah a large number of birds out in the bush it, it just wouldn't work so yeah so that that was certainly a part of it but you know there are hardships to that sort of life and animals and nature can be cruel sometimes but it is a part of nature and it's something that we accepted and we grew up with uh, and that's you know that's all part of the story and it's something that that is fantastic to be and it to. brought you back to your roots it, yeah. you you never 
lose your connection with animals once you start with it. Yeah. You always want to be around them. You always want to be with them. There's a certain reason. And I just love what you're bringing to the door in the UK. It's it's a game changer. We talked a little bit before the interview about the fact that you can farm broilers differently in Zambia than the UK or even here in the US. You had open-sided buildings. In terms of being commercial, just the way the market was, there weren't many large producers. You know, the world has changed so rapidly in terms of technology and and getting as many pounds of meat out of a square meter. You know, that's what that's the metrics now. Uh, what right. we could do we had the space and we had the you know cheap cost of buildings, so we had very much open side poultry runs, very long and a much lower density, probably a third of what it is standard commercial here. So you know that was really important, and and that developed all the way through the the sort of marketing process of the product that we were selling um you know there was no bruising there was we, they were really well cared for and they had we naturally we didn't think about that we just thought well that's how you want to treat animals you know you want right. to give them space air good food you know clean water and and have the best life possible so it was much less an issue there about you know the the whole business of factory farming that it is now so you know that is part of it which is gave me a lot of satisfaction to be actually, I think, just to be able to have the opportunity to provide a product that would, the well-being and the welfare of of hens for a domestic owner is so important. There was a huge connection there that that is such an important part of what we're doing and, and drives a lot of how we do it and how we approach the whole process of, of providing a product to, to hen owners who, I mean, it's a big responsibility because you're feeding a live product you know, you've got to make sure that it's safe uh, and, and it's it's the best possible condition and freshest product that it can be because you want those hens to have the full benefit of it. So mm-hmm. it was a real satisfaction that just clicked with me and thought, this is a great idea and the market's big enough and, you know, there's no reason why we can't make this work. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in, in a year or so if, it, if we're right about <laughs> if that. It does. We'll have you back <laughs> on. Yes. So we commend you. I mean, the quality of life, of the animal being your number one, you know, thought in that industry is is I, highly commendable. I just wish thank you for doing that. More we thank businesses you. around the world would just think a little bit more about the welfare of the animals. And you, like you said, now you're turning it into let's think how we can now bring the soldier fly grub into the UK in a way that is legal and working. So I want to turn to the product and mm. talk about. When somebody orders them, how big do they, a container do they get? And how long do they have to give their chickens these? So are, are they going to live for a certain amount of time? And then, you know, do you you have to give them living? So a little of the logistics of it. Yeah, like you, you zeroed in on yeah. something really important. And I'll let Kirsty uh, talk more about this. Um, okay. And But other than to say, you know, getting the product, with the, with with the e-commerce the way it's set up and being able to courier product overnight so that the customer orders the day before and one day later they have that product on their doorstep wow. so being fresh is is really important so we do a, an overnight delivery service but let me just hand over to Kirsty because she'll she'll give you more color of that yeah we want to know more details okay <laughs> so the larvae is sent out in portions of 10 grams per bird per day and we send a week supply at a time. So people can purchase on a one-off basis or they can subscribe either on a weekly, two weekly or four weekly basis. So some nice. people want to feed every day. Others will want to feed a little uh, more sporadically or as a treat. Um, the larvae, we tell people to feed the larvae within 10 days and they would not pupate for around 14 days after delivery, but we like to err on the side of caution and say um, they should feed within 10 days. And 10 grams per day per bird is a re- it, it's a very conservative amount. And going back to Paul's focus on his responsibility uh, and, and welfare, that ties in with that because every conversation I've ever had with Paul has been so laser focused on doing the absolute right and best thing by the hens and I really want to 
I really want to emphasize that point that they could sell so much more of this product because Paul has spoken in depth with poultry nutritionists to find out the, the, the exact safe amounts that, that hens can be fed with the larvae to avoid any issues with feeding them too much protein or uh, too much calcium. And the, the, the safe limits are actually far beyond what, what we recommend. But because of the differences in sizes and ages of, and of you know, mixed flocks, Paul's been determined to err on the side of caution and ensure that you know, hens get enough, that they will feel the benefits, but that there are no risks there of us recommending overfeeding. So 10 grams per day is, is a safe amount for all size, so from bantams through to larger, larger breeds, but larger breeds could have quite substantially more than the 10 grams, but that's really up to the individual owners you know, and, and to their discretion. So yeah, they're packaged up in a lovely tube, sent out the same day, and usually Royal Mail Willing arrive the next day. They are fresh and wriggling, and now it's cold though. We have to tell people that when they arrive, they might be quite still because they've got cold. But once you bring them inside and take the lid off and leave them for half an hour at room temperature, then they now they is start this a wriggling. snack that you have to feed the snack? first to give to the like to keep them going or I know that seems like a silly question but so once they come to you in the tube they will be alive for 10 to 14 days and they don't need to be fed or anything in there no they have fed so they've reached the end of their life cycle they stop feeding and then Paul has a really clever system where once the larvae have reached this optimum stage they then self-harvest and they climb up ramps onto a conveyor belt themselves so that they oh, wow. signify when they are ready. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Paul? And then the conveyor yeah. belt delivers them and they're deposited into crates. And then that's where we fill up the Love fill it. up the tubes. That's when they're ready. And I think the stage of their life cycle is also really important because some people have been feeding their, their hens live insects, including the black soldier fly larvae in the UK for some time. But they would get them from pet stores and the Mm. pet stores target market is reptile and rodent Mm. keepers Mm -hmm. and they eat tiny portions so we're talking you know a a lizard might have one or two so Mm. it's a very very expensive way to buy the live insects they come in little tubs whereas the difference here is because the chickens are our target target market they're sold in poultry appropriate portions and you're getting much more than the tiny little tubs that you would get if you went to the pet store and bought them intended for reptiles. I absolutely love the fact that they are there in overnight or you know the next day just because if you do have a hen who's doing poorly and you need to get something into her that's very manageable. Mm -hmm. You know you're not ordering and getting them five days later. I'm also curious can other poultry eat them? You know can you feed them to ducks or turkeys? Absolutely, yeah. All insectivorous animals, all all omnivores can eat them. They're they're safe for wildlife, for live birds, particularly good for hedgehogs. Um, I love uh, it. (laughs) Yeah, there's a whole market of people who buy these just for their little hedgehogs that run around their garden to keep them going. But yeah, all birds can partake in the lobby, obviously just in in differing portion sizes, depending on the size of the size of the breed but ducks absolutely so we do market them um two ducks so it's a much smaller market so growing uh yeah we we had someone share a video of that and they float so if you do have if you do have ducks then you can feed them in water and someone shared a video of them um feeding their ducks the larvae and they're bobbing along in the water and yeah all omnivores can eat them even us if you're so inclined Mm. i have (laughs) it's virus season isn't it at the moment so my kids are coming home like every other day and with a new cold and a new oh yeah uh, a new virus and, I'm, and with all of the disease fighting benefits of the larvae the um antiviral properties in the lauric acid and i'm starting to think could i put these in their lunchbox well, you could but it might not end well it might not be popular at the lunch table after they take oh. things in <laughs> Well, at least it's not chocolate, you know, like right. something was wiggling in your child's lunchbox. <laughs> 
part of this whole journey we've had is to, a lot of this is education. A lot of hen keepers didn't really know that they, they knew about insects, normally about dry. There was a lot of education that we had to go through first. And Kirsty has been supremely good at doing that. I think the whole challenge was people's perceptions immediately. They think of Malawi or they sort of call it what they would think was a maggot, which is a sort of wet, slimy, horrible. So you're going to get over that perception first. The black soldier fly larvae, they're incredible because this this is where it starts to get. And sorry, I'm, I'm going to go back to the larvae because this is what fascinates no, me. And let people know how they do actually work. So we breed them from flies in, in our own propagation room. The flies lay the eggs and we take them and we hatch them into what we call, they were much bigger growing crates than what traditionally used, but we grow them in a in a medium and a substrate that is very aerated. So we put a bulking agent in there, sort of chopped up hay and stuff. And what that does is it, it allows a lot of oxygen to get into the substrate. It allows a lot of heat to, to dissipate because larvae, they're such voracious eaters that they generate a huge amount of temperature within their feeding space. But the great thing about them is, as Kirsty alluded to there, is that when they are ready and they go through the growth cycle, which is you know around 21 days from hatchlings through the part where they're ready to become their pre-pupa, they will stop eating. And when they know that they want to pupate, they'll stop eating, so they'll clear their gut, which is a really important issue about in terms of passing that on to the end user. So they clean, their, they clear their gut, and they self-harvest. And that is something that when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's amazing. A lot of black soldier fly larvae that you will find worldwide in terms of how they're harvested, they would normally, because it's it's a lot more, I don't mind how long they take to get to the point where they want to self-harvest, but a lot would take them off slightly younger than that. When they're ready to pupate, they actually get a, a slightly harder exoskeleton and they darken up. Normally, on a commercial basis, they would normally just extract everything out of the crates before that before that stage, then mechanically separate them from the material and then put them normally through if it's going to be processed to protein, etc. So I like the fact that I wouldn't have to have any equipment to separate them. They did it themselves and they literally do that. So and they do it very efficiently. So we can get them fresh out. They are clean, they're dry. We send off tests every week to the lab to check what the E. coli count is and any other pathogens that are present. And it's very low, surprisingly. I mean they live essentially in their in their feces in in where they are but that's what they do and their mm-hmm. whole their whole systems are set up for that they produce their own peptides you know antimicrobial they they normally feed in waste in the wild as in in the US you know where the, where they are where they originate from so they need to have that protection but the great thing about it those antimicrobial properties and and actions actually go forward and pass onto the onto the bird that's what struck me as the best they never stop giving to these larvae they're incredible in so the perception and education of what they are and what they can achieve was incredible. And we did some research. We were very fortunate enough to get uh, some grant funding from the UK government, Innovate UK, to be able to conduct research. And we did a research on just to really, we were looking at, it's not so much the nutritional. There's no there's no doubt that they are incredibly nutritionally dense. They, you know, they, they're 50% protein, 30% fat. And who wouldn't like that in their diet? They're of, also fun. Yeah, exactly that. For the birds, for yeah, the they, chickens, they are fun for the oh, chickens. So, so, yeah, it gets yeah, a little like, bit of a boredom buster. They get to chase that's these right. bugs. Normally, you know, their food's just given to them, and right. it's there. This is a little bit mm-hmm. of a challenge. A more natural. Yeah, well, and they don't. I mean, you're right that they don't look super gross. If you're a chicken keeper, you see gross stuff every day. That's just part of. That's how it goes. Yeah, that's, that's chicken life. Right. I mean, here in the U.S., we have the 17 year cicada cycle. And I don't know if you've ever seen a cicada larva. It is not pretty. And our chickens just went insane. I think that's the best day of our chickens lives when those first cicadas started to emerge. I felt so bad for the cicada because it lived underground for 17 years. And the ones that came up in the chicken runs were they saw light for a nanosecond and then boom, they were gone. So, I mean, and they were huge. They were huge. But we saw um, Arthur Parkinson did a video on his Instagram where he was feeding them. And they don't look slimy. They don't look gross. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really, I I mean. Sally did too. Sally did as well. Sally Quithard did as well. And they, I mean, their chickens clearly love them. I'm not particularly squeamish. I grew up on a farm. I'm a little more squeamish than you. But I would be fine. You would not mind handling. I I would be okay. 
I mean, I've had to go through some major stuff in an animal hospital, believe me. So I would be fine with it. While we're talking about gross, I'm very curious. You don't need to handle them, though. I will just say that this, um, that, that was purely Sally's choice. She was happy to get stuck in there and hold them. <laughs> but, but, but when we... She just, I, I don't know, she didn't have to, but she just wanted to. Um, we send them out in tubes with, with a, a lid and you just need to pour the larvae into the lid and weigh out the portion. Um, okay. And then you just feed. So so if people don't want to handle them, there's no need to touch them no. at so all. I probably would. Um, handle them. Yeah. Probably. I, would. I know I would. Sally's a hardcore country girl. I, <laughs> so that's okay. We like, we like that. Now, Again, speaking of gross stuff, I'm very curious, what do you do with the frass? Which, to our listeners who don't know what frass is, that's the nice word for poop. Yep. So here's the beauty of it. This is where the story gets better. We get two byproducts out of the process of that larvae growth production. One is a a liquid fraction. So it's the juice that percolates through, put a lot of water into the crates. You know, the, the, the larvae are eating very fast. Um, they're eating a lot. They need a lot of moisture to sustain them to be able to do that. And everything else, it does affect and, and help with the cooling as well. So there is a liquid that percolates out. It's like uh, people would probably describe it as a tea, if you like. Well, but right. Has, oh, yeah, no. I, mean, I just wrote that down. Of, you did. Of, of and that's why you drink coffee. So. I yeah. literally just wrote that she down. She wrote down poop tea. Back on my family farm, we <laughs> call that poop tea. Actually, it's a big thing yeah. over here. It is amazing for your garden. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's exactly it. So we get we that's get the liquid fraction, which is unique to our production process. That we can we actually sieve that and collect it out, and then you've got you know the substrate that they grow in, which which is a combination of the, in our case some bulking agents, but it's the frass, there's exoskeletons as they are growing and and through the life cycle they're shedding mm-hmm. their skins. Um, plus there's you some should left- say that the substrate. We've mentioned it a few times, but I haven't said what it is and what they're fed on, which I think is quite important. Mm. But um, the substrate that we use is spe- uh, spent brewer's grain. And Paul built up a partnership with a brewery, a local brewery called Yale Brewery, and they supply their sp- uh, spent grain to Eco Nourish, which is that's what the larvae are fed on. And so it helps Yale Brewery to improve their sustainability cred. And that is the circular economy. They're helping with the beer economy. Oh, that is amazing. Adult beverages <laughs> and chicken stuff. You, it doesn't get better than yeah. that. They need to name a beer after a chicken or they something do. over there. Oh, or right. the they need to do that. Yeah. I think they yeah. really do. The soldier so, fly it's, brew. Or it's, something. You said it was Yale. Yale is the brewery. Uh, Yale. Yale. Y-A-L-E. Yale, Yale. 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 Yale brewery. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's that, that's what the sub uh, that's what the the larvae are fed on. That's the substrate. Paul really proud of like that circular economy where the the brewer spent grain comes to the larvae. The larvae bio convert that into nutritious hen feed, and then the larvae's frass. Yeah, so we call it a biocompost. So, biocompost, yeah. yeah. And then that's used to to grow crops, and so that circular economy continues. So yeah, when it's you- actually it's Vale, vale Brewery. They're a, they're a small microbrewery, and you know they have this spent waste coming out, and it's a problem. They normally try and give it away because it's a waste product they do. So we can utilize that waste and bring it into the system. So we have a great relationship with them, and they've they've been fantastic support to us. So yeah, we're getting two byproducts. One is liquid, and one is the the sort of we call a biocompost, which is the which is left over, and both of those have beneficial microbes in them anyway just in the nature of you know, you're putting in food and the warmth and, and air and everything else and you so you have a a very good population of positive microbes so those two byproducts are what we develop one because the beneficial microbes boost growth in plants they help provide nutrients to the roots that are much more attainable and much more accessible than you would from an inorganic fertilizer so it's you know that's a great story so we can produce all this with actually pretty much zero waste in our production process which is is unique and and we're lucky to be able to have that so we will get three products out of this and so we can maximize that diversified product base which is fantastic amazing that is amazing so one other thing we just want to get into a little bit more and that is, there's always been so much confusion about the DEFRA regulations and feeding insects to hens in the UK. So 
how did you approach this when you came up with this idea? Did you have to do a lot of research? Did you have to talk with DEFRA and, you know, get a really strict definition of their regulations? Because we don't want people to be afraid to feed right. these because they're going against a regulation. So mm-hmm. let's just clear the air. These are fine in the UK to feed your chickens. They are absolutely fine. And Paul received a letter from DEFRA, which is on our website, confirming that live feeding the black soldier fly larva would not be in any way contravening DEFRA laws surrounding processed terrestrial invertebrates. So the law only applies to processed terrestrial invertebrates. So that's essentially, you know, dead, dried, in any way processed insects. But live insects are absolutely DEFRA approved. The only stipulation they had was regarding the frass, which Paul has has already cleared up. So you have to have a way to separate the larvae from the frass. But because of the process that and the stage of life at which the larvae are harvested, they have cleared out their gut, they have stopped eating, the frass is left behind and they self-harvest and separate themselves from the frass. So it absolutely complies with those regulations. And that was a big challenge in terms of the market's reception to the product because that there was a whole, whoa, we can't feed insects. I mean, you can't stop hens from eating insects. You know, they're going to... (laughs) Is it more of the preservation of the dried insect that, that they're trying to stop basically using a pesticide to keep them no. fresher longer is that what why the dry let me give you it's, I think it's, it's the origin yeah, uh, let, me give you, let me give you a bit of background the reason this legislation is in place the uk went through a, a time where there was something called mad cow disease and that was because processed animal protein was being fed back in the food chain oh okay back, they were they were feeding rendered meat back into the food chain for pigs, uh, etc. Oh. And mad cow disease came out of that. So the legislation grew from that and they're very strict about it. So you can't, any processed animal protein has to go through an abattoir and be licensed and, and inspected. We can't do that with millions of larvae every day. So so the legislation was such that you can't process it. You can't dry it. You can't process it into meal and feed it to livestock that's in the food chain. So pigs and poultry, you can't do that. It is allowed for fish. But in the UK, now UK is one of the last places that those legislation is there. Europe has now gone and moved forward and they are happy now with the way the industry's worked and to make sure that, you know, the standards are there. You know, we're governed very strictly. We get inspected by the trading standards office in, in the UK. So they will, you know, we know everyone who's using our product knows that we are inspected and we are abiding by the law. But for us, we chose to go for the live product. And because of their live product, they fall outside that legislation in terms of, you know. Excellent. So, you know, that's great for us. The legislation may change at some point as it has in Europe. And then that animal, that protein meal can then be processed and fed into the livestock feed chain. One really important thing to point out is that it's also to do with what the larvae are fed on and Mm. when purchasing dried larvae they they could be coming from overseas usually from china and it's unregulated in terms of what they're fed on and it is often animal protein and human waste (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) really grim and so the the potential for pathogens to then make it into the human food chain is a huge risk. And that's why, and, and not just that, but also a huge disease risk to the animals because dried BSF larvae and dried mealworms have been shown in a lot of cases to have E. coli and salmonella and parasites. So it's just not safe to feed dried insects when you don't know where they've come from and which country mm-hmm. they have originated from and what they've been fed on. But when they are alive, they have to have been farmed in the UK and it is heavily regulated. As Paul said, and he has visits from trading standards and, and everything has to be above board. So those are the reasons to definitely go live and go local with yeah. your sex in the UK because it's unregulated. In other countries where you are able to feed processed insects it's regulated and and you don't have such issues but where they're imported yeah i mean the, the, that, those the, are the worries the very fact that you have this really admirable and fairly amazing closed food chain for these the, the larvae is just oh, we're kind of envious you know, we, <laughs> we, we are we are we, we don't want have, some. right you know exactly 
where your products are coming from and where they're going. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have anything that's that transparent. And I think it's amazing. It's amazing. So what this brings me to is I want to ask the future of EcoNourish. What do you see for your company in the future? Any new projects coming out or are we just focusing on the live grubs right now? Yeah, I'm glad you raised that. It's obviously, that's always in the horizon as to where do we go next? We've launched the product four or five months ago. We're starting to scale up now as e-commerce does take some time, as you well know. And without Kirsty being on board, we wouldn't have actually been anywhere near where we are today. So this early success has been down to Kirsty largely and getting that education and, and that content out in the social media has been incredible to watch and see the response. What's really I love about this is that it's the hens themselves that actually are selling our product. The wonderful thing, the whole welfare, the hen welfare and how that and the response you get from the hens. And I think once people get a chance to get access to the product, the live larvae, feed into the hens and the response they get, and it takes a couple of days and then you walk out that door or you go to the shed where you hold keeping or wherever you're keeping your larvae, the chickens will come running after you. And that's just... <laughs> So they sell the product for us. So we're in cahoots with the hens and, and they're really responsible for the growth of our product scale as it goes. The product made my job easy because people respond to it so positively that I have so much to work with. It's the training aspect, the fact that once they build up this recognition, they will follow you anywhere. And there's no more chasing your chickens, trying to get them back into the coop at night. You just bring out the green tube and they're like, hello. And we've got videos galore of, of people's children holding a tube and they're like the Pied Piper and chickens are just following them all around the garden and into the coop. And that's how much they love them. And it is, as, as you said before, it's the fun. It's the fact that they're alive and offer such enrichment benefits and, and fulfill their natural instincts. I always say my biggest problem in marketing this product is there are so many benefits that it can be a bit like information overload and you really have to kind of hone it in and figure out which are the most important ones to which people. But the list is, you know, as long as my arm in terms of how many unique benefits these these little creatures have. Chickens are highly intelligent, so they know the benefits. Yeah, yeah. They don't it, eat things that aren't good for them usually. usually not. So, you know, they're going to know, like, these are good for me. It makes me feel good. I want these. And, you know, it's working along with the chicken, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So it is a, you, you can use them for training purposes. We know we've, we've spoken with chicken trainers before. Mm -hmm. They are have the intellect to do certain things and this is a tool that you can use like yeah. i said it's a boredom buster it's it yeah in many different ways and like you were saying the list goes on and on i'm just happy that the uk finally can benefit from them you've not even been on the market for six months yet and you know, yeah. there's a huge buzz already which is it's yeah. well deserved as it's there is a huge buzz. That. Yeah, and I think, you know, and to, to answer your question, what we'll do is obviously try and roll out the, the product to as many domestic owners as we can because there really is the benefit, not only nutritionally, but because of all these health benefits that come alongside that. We know there is research on it, but the anecdotal evidence is coming back through our customers. It's incredible mm -hmm. about yeah. the, the benefit of feathering and the birds that are pooling, how it perks them up and gets them back on their feet. So I think, you know, we will expand that market and try and service as much as that we can. That's definitely our priority. But what's very important to me in the longer term, and to answer your question is, there is the other side of the market, the reptile market is very important. But what we would really like to do, there is the benefit and not necessarily from a nutritional point of view, but we would like to develop the scale so that we can bring the price into a place where the commercial producers can actually get the benefit. Wow. Um, the layer side, we, we obviously well know what's going on there. But in terms of the broilers, we are really trying to push forward and do some research. Um, and there has been some done already about the benefit of, of broadcasting live larvae into a broiler house. And what that does is, like any bird will do, it'll attract and see those wriggling larvae, and they will they will try and they will start foraging for those. And what that does is, you're not trying to feed every bird larvae; you're trying to get the general population of birds to be attracted to that and look for them. So that foraging instinct is an immediate stimulus to the bird. It's something that it's a natural instinct. It boosts their whole welfare status by doing that. But more importantly. Broilers have a big, the way broilers are kept commercially, 
the big issue they have is with the legs. The legs, mm -hmm. you know, they're growing so fast. They're not being able to walk around. Their legs get weak and they, you know, that's a major issue. By having larvae broadcast into the house, stimulates the birds to go and they scratch around they start using their legs and they're turning over the litter which is you know that's another benefit to the whole story so there is an application in the commercial market and i, I fully believe that the live larvae themselves would be able to access that not only as processed protein that other producers will certainly be doing but but that live the live feeding aspect which i don't think anyone would think would be economically viable but actually it can be because we can feed a small amount of larvae or broadcast that into a broiler house and that'll get them all going plenty of room to grow here and we want to try and, and get there and it's just it's very satisfying to be able to bring that to to the commercial sector it's That's brilliant awesome. i yeah. wish there were more people you're one of the first people i've ever heard that want to make the quality of a life of a meat chicken better mm -hmm. and you know that touch that just gave me chills right there just thinking about that because you know, your background and what you did and what you're doing is so good for the chickens, for the earth, for everything. And wow. Wow. Just wow. wow. I I love that. That's amazing. It, it really is. I really wish that we had more. We need more people like you, Paul, out we there. Really we do. really do. About the commercial, the welfare of commercial birds. I mean, it's it's so important. And frankly, it's heartbreaking and horrifying in a lot of cases. So. There are a few people that I meet that really strike me and you have. Agreed. And that right there, thinking of an animal that is a, that's going to feed and, and their welfare is yeah. amazing. And thank you. I don't think we can top this part of the conversation. So we're going to take a complete 180. And we ask everybody this. We question. do, and they're they're totally not fair questions. We're asking it anyway. <laughs> and you're allowed to have more than one. And we're going to start with Kirsty. Now we know you don't have them yet, but we know that you have chickens coming. You have ordered your chickens. What breeds and which is going to be your favorite? Okay, so we have some Polish hens coming. Oh, my favorites. Um, they're my favorites. They're my favorites. It's the do. I just. I'm in love. We have a hen who's become like the face of Eco Nourish. Um, and she's Zoe, the Polish hen. She is one of our customers' hens and she's taken some wonderful photos of her. And she's just, oh, I'm just in love with her. So we have some Polish heads coming and some silkies because I hear that they get on quite well because they're both docile and quite dim, I'm told. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and so they get on quite well and they, they don't bully each other because they're both quite, you know, Behind. They're, <laughs> yes, it they're at the bottom of the pecking order usually. So those two are good paired yeah. together. And then I also have some peckings come from, so I'm going to hit up. So Charlie, who runs the Instagram account, Eggs and Fluff, who's a hen influencer in the UK, um, breeds lavender peckings. And so I've got my eye on that and, and a few of those. As long as, now they've all got short legs then, so they should be okay. But as long as um, the peckings don't get, you know, don't start on the Polish hen, but we'll see. So I'm, I've got um, a trio of each breed. Coming You'll have to check January. out our social media of my Houdans. They're the relative of Polish. I love these chickens. They're black and white model. They are the silliest chickens ever. Very sweet. Americans, remember, we call them coach and bantams, but they're not really. They really are Pekin. Lavender Pekins sound Absolutely stunning. That sounds amazing. Coach and Bantams. I always like to get to her with that. They're a separate breed. Bantam. They're a separate breed. I've done monstrous amounts of research and writing. They are a separate breed from the large fowl coach. And anyway, Bantam. off that soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. What have I done? <laughs> no, just, you just unleashed us is all you did. Doesn't take much. <laughs> no. um, but they sound like really, really beautiful breeds. What color of Polish did you get? They haven't been hatched yet, so I don't know, but I'm just okay. reserved. I'm just reserved. Um, okay. I've reserved three Polish and three Silkies, but I'll get to choose my actual birds when I go and visit the breeder. I'm so excited and my children are so excited. And I have literally harassed my husband for the last six months about this because I'm so in love. I've done so much research and I have learned so much about chickens. I just feel like that knowledge needs to have an application <laughs> outside does. of work. You can um, say it's because of my job. Right. That's what I we know. tell our husbands. It's because of our job. 
Yeah. And my sister works with me as well on our on social media oh, side. Nice. She's also chicken obsessed and she's working on her husband, but she is beyond excited what about the experience. Fact that now- you need it. You need to do this. Do. You're gonna have the most beautiful flock. That just sounds fantastic. So Paul, excited. it is your turn. <laughs> we know you're keeping chickens. Can you tell us any breed you're keeping and what are your favorites? Oh, it's amazing. I, getting back into sort of getting knowledge about the breeds that are available. And the UK, there are some very passionate breeders, and it's fantastic to see. We have three disabled poots and a, a pecan, a black pecan. Um, oh. They're all, all gorgeous. I mean, they integrate really well. So we've only got we've only got the four, but it's just great because it allows me to let my kids have access to chickens and chickens. And when you when you can do like we do, I mean, they all they really want from me is some larvae, but I, I can take that. But what they do is when they come out in the morning, they'll come down onto the patio and they'll come and sit at the window and they'll watch us while we have breakfast. You know, we oh. haven't got the point yet where we're letting them come into the house, but it's I know a lot of people do that, but that's yes, just, you draw the line there. But yeah, no, they're great, they're great fun and they have such characters and you can't help but fall in love with them. There's no doubt about that. Sable poots. So Americans, uh, we would call them booted bantams here. Right. Sable okay. poots are so stinking cute. They're all cute. The bantams are they so are. adorable. So cute. They're gorgeous. Yeah. They are gorgeous. Like a, of them running down the garden with those feathery feet. <laughs> yes. They, they are always the ones that do the absolute best on on instagram people just go oh my god their feet and they they are so adorable and we have full-size coaching so we get that the, the ride in slow motion with the feathered feet my husband has a pet and he is a pet um and he's a duclé not a sable poot but when i let him out every morning he does the dance and the the feathers on their feet it's just the most ridiculous thing it's so cute i just stand there and laugh every morning he makes my day they, they do make your day. The chickens do. And, and to be able to give them something so nutritious and so much fun, it makes you feel good inside. It makes them feel good. And, you know, that's part of the relationship. And we were talking, who are we talking with? It was, it might've been the guys over at Neutrina Feed. And they were saying, this sounds a little, you know, cushy, but oh, happy chickens touchy lay feeling. more eggs. Right, yeah, right. touchy feely. And it's true. Yeah. When they're happy, they want to do everything. You know, mm-hmm. they happy chickens are happy. Help- they're laying eggs, they're dust bathing, they're getting their treats. And you're yeah. just helping all those chickens in the UK be happier. So do they chase you every time they see you because they're waiting for, for the larva every time? They will watch me as soon as they see it. it depends where I'm heading. So if I'm going up the garden towards where I keep the larvae, they're right in behind me. Then they know. Yeah. So they, <laughs> they're like, they're this is the benefit of our dad being the co-founder <laughs> of this company. This is like, yes, constantly. Yeah, I know. They, they get they get good stuff. They they enjoy it. They get the best I've got to offer them. So they're happy. Oh, I love this. Okay, so. You guys, it's been an amazing hour chatting chickens and soldier fly grubs and all the fun things. And it's been such a pleasure to meet you both. We want to thank you for coming on the show and talking about Eco Nourish and all the good things you're going to do. We can't wait. And we would love to have you back. If you want to come on six months from now, a year from now, give us an update. and We'll Absolutely. talk more fun breeds and larva. We got a way to no, gotta get you over here with some larva too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've made it so easy and it's just so enjoyable and thank you so much we really are we're so happy and and um honored that you let us let us come on to your show of course it's um but it's just good to talk to people who are that passionate and it's just it's very <laughs> it's great stuff likewise and oh, the thank honor was ours and, thank and keep you doing this great work it's just brilliant and, and i'm not surprised you've got such a great follow in uk and hopefully <laughs> hopefully this will help grow it thank you thank you so much we'll talk to you soon cheers now we just want to thank Paul and Kirsty one more time for spending a really fascinating hour talking with us. Make sure you go visit the Eco Nourish website and learn more about this great company. If you're in the UK. It's right. <laughs> a complete UK company. Yes. But it was, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. So much fun. It's great You stuff. guys are great. Okay. So let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week's crack in the eggs, Holly Ann is going to say it was mine. It was mine. I rolled my eyes. But we're just going to talk to everybody out there. Are you guys, it's <laughs> December 5th. I mean, we've been talking to you for a while now, but it's December 5th. 
I mean, the holidays are coming upon us. Yeah. And the last thing that anybody feels like doing the whole month of December is making dinner. You got so many other things to do. You know, it's that time. So we're doing some quick and easy recipes for December. I was rebelling. I'm going to tell you the first line of this recipe. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. This is another Chrissy recipe for using up Thanksgiving leftovers. Because I still have them. (laughs) (laughs) Now, if you host Thanksgiving or you just make it for yourself, the food can last a week or two. Not with Pete in the house. (laughs) (laughs) And... Sometimes you're like, how else do I want to serve up these leftovers? It's true. And again, we did make this for super quick and super easy. So we're using a Bisquick crust for maximum easiness. So can you guess what we're doing this week? It's an easy weeknight pot pie. Pot pie. I love myself some pot pies. Well, I did go along with this eventually because I got to make it with gluten-free Bisquick. Yeah. Which was nice. And I actually used... A little known ingredient for some people. I used jackfruit in place of turkey. You made it interesting and different. Jackfruit is, yeah, I don't even know how to describe jackfruit. But if you cook it the right way, it kind of takes on the texture of pulled pork or shredded Mm -hmm. turkey. Mm -hmm. So we went with that. And for the gravy, you have a few options. You can use leftover turkey gravy. Do you have leftover turkey gravy, Chris? Yes, I do. You can use that. You can use cream of mushroom soup. You can use any kind of cream of whatever soup. Now, or you could just use gravy. You could use, just use the gravy. But if you have to be gluten and dairy free and you don't have any gravy or soup on hand, I gave you the recipe for my own cream of mushroom soup. It's very quick and easy to make. Okay, so let's talk about, we'll just go over the ingredients of the cream of mushroom soup. It's an onion chopped, two cloves of garlic minced, a teaspoon of dried thyme, a pound of mushrooms, because it's cream of mushroom soup. Mm-hmm. A quarter of a cup of all-purpose flour or gluten-free all-purpose flour, and one to one and a half cups of broth or stock of your choice. Yeah. Very quickly. You cook the onions in olive oil till they soften and start to brown. You put the garlic thyme in there, stir them for a couple more minutes, add the mushrooms, saute them. They'll start releasing water. You're just going to cook them stirring until the water starts to dry up. You're going to add your broth and your flour and stir until thickened. Bam, cream of mushroom soup. Thank you, ma'am. You got it. So all you do for a pot pie is put everything that's cooked in there and then bake it together that's and it. make your crust. I mean, it's simple. It's easy. It's home cooked. Everything's already cooked. You put it in the pie dish. You make your crust, your bisquick. You put it all along the top. And then you bake it at 350 until everything comes together and your crust looks nice, light, and brown. And you Filling have, is bubbling. And, yeah. Yeah. You have a home cooked meal that you can just serve out into bowls. Yes. And it's great. Um, It makes me very nostalgic for the 1980s because my mom made a lot of Bisquick pot pie. We had a lot of Swanson's pot pies. Did you? Did anybody out there put your hand up if you had a Swanson's pot pie growing up that were frozen? Yeah, we we had them. My mom would put them in the oven Mm -hmm. and they'd have to bake for an hour. It was a long bake, yeah. It was a long bake. It was like, is Mm -hmm. this homemade? Well, it's a Swanson's frozen yeah. pot pie. But they were good. I love those things. Yeah. They were good. And you got your own little pie. Because they were actually in a real pie pastry crust. Yes. Yeah. They had the crust on the bottom too. Yep. And mm-hmm. the crust on the bottom was always my favorite. Yeah. It kind of does take me back to my childhood. It I does. think that's, that's why okay. I like pot pies. But yeah. So if you had a Swanson one, raise your hand. I think we're all raising our hands right now. Well, anyone of our generation, yes. some of the younger generations. Anyway, might not have- 35. <laughs> 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 oh my God. <laughs> Okay, so enjoy. Take a picture of it. You might try it. You might like it or you might love it. Might love it. It's a quick and easy recipe. Another way just to use an egg or two. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're talking gifts for your favorite chicken people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We love ourselves some chicken people. Crazy or not. (laughs) Yeah. So, we are crazy chicken ladies. We are. I mean, we love our chicken gifts. We put the crazy in crazy chicken ladies. (laughs) So, there are a lot of things out there that you can get your chicken person. Absolutely. A person that loves chickens. Mm -hmm. And the list goes on and on and on. It does. And I think we have mostly all of it. We have a lot. And I just keep getting more, which I'm fine with. Yeah, I agree. Okay, we're going to start off with, now this is an Etsy shop. 
and it's a potter. You know, I, I'm a kind You're of all a about hobby the potter. I love the pottery. So this is White Swan Studio. She is a potter out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Nice. And she makes really, really gorgeous stuff. A lot of chickens and a lot of farm animals. Now, my first pick is called an egg bageler. And it is essentially a ceramic dish with a hole in the middle. Oh, you make the bagel in it. You make the eggs in it. Oh, the eggs. And then it's shaped for your bagel. It's shaped for your bagel. That's really cool. But what I love is that she puts chicken decals under the glaze. I like In the that. bowl. So it's about, it's $28 to buy an egg bageler, but I think that's an amazing gift for a chicken lady with discerning culinary well, thank taste. you. Are you getting me one? I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I'm going to go with one of our all-time favorites that is like near and dear to my heart, and that's Lenora Dame. If you have a chicken lady, go over to Lenora Dame and look at this website and their chicken jewelry. It's every single piece is handmade You cannot go wrong with it. It's eccentric. It's different. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you can give that's so unique. Holly's just gasping at something. Well, I just found an egg carton. It's one of those old vintage types. And it's got Christmas on the front of it. It is so stinking cute. There's a duck and a chicken. So egg cartons are a good gift to give. That are designed. They have vintage designs on them, and they're just adorable. And, I'm so, I got really distracted by that. Well, I'm sorry. Those would be good to give to someone who's going to keep for their own eggs and mm-hmm. not give away. Right. You know? So the other things that are out there, I mean, there are a plethora of everything known to chicken. There's cups. There's mugs. There's a coffee with the chicken ladies mug. Why? There is. That, I'm sure your chicken friend What a lovely love. mug with a beautiful watercolor design. Yes, or even the t-shirt from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. Yes. Any of those, or the tiny hens. Now, there's lots of chicken teas out there. Mm-hmm, a lot of chicken teas. I found a really cool on Etsy. This is Fabulous Fab Company, and it's funny chicken coaster set, four wood coasters, with chicken prints on them. Oh, so it's sort of etched into the wood or wood burning, I think that's yes, called. And yes. the chickens are all, okay, the chickens are all wearing glasses. That's pretty cute. And we love that because we always have a drink around us. You right, know, like, and right. the chickens have glasses on. They're super cute. Mm-hmm. You can check that out on Etsy. That would be a great gift for your chicken person. I do love the egg bagelers. Holly Ann's still stuck on the egg bagelers over here. Well, it's really nice. Now, I found the cutest ever. Chicken butt succulent planter. That is super cute. Okay. So it's literally a little chicken butt with legs and the succulent grows out of it. (laughs) That is really cute. Okay. It is so cute. It's from Beaks Emporium on Etsy. Beaks Emporium. Yes. And it's $18. It's marked down 25%, but it's cute. If you just want to give somebody something different to stick on a windowsill Mm -hmm. or a desk, And it's just a really cute little thing for your chicken person. For your chicken person. My next pick, again, on Etsy. Most of these are on Etsy just because you can get such cool stuff on there. Yeah. My next pick is a shop called Romanian Handcrafted. Okay. And they make these absolutely, I mean, drop the gorgeous pendants. They're painted with floral designs using wax. But the whole thing is the pendant base is a goose egg. That's really cool. No, I tried to find them on chicken eggs. I didn't see them. I think goose eggs are bigger and sturdier. Yeah, exactly. But they run about $23. That's not bad. No. I think you need to order them like right now. Because they ship from Italy. Yeah, they ship from Italy if you want to get them now. But again, they're linked in the show notes. And check them out because they're gorgeous. I mean, for $23, gorgeous. it's a beautiful gift. You only have to give one gift under $25. And you look like a rock star giving mm-hmm. that necklace. It's beautiful. It's handmade. It's done. My next pick is from Ingrained Memories. You can get a cutting board made with your roosters, your chickens on it. With You're your all names. about the wood this year. I like myself some wood. (laughs) And I really like this. The one they have up here showed it has a tree with initials of Jack and Mary Jo. Jack and Mary Jo. (laughs) And all the chicks and the chickens. I like the engraved stuff and I feel like you can make it personal. It means something too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could go until... My last pick, again, still on Etsy. And this isn't just one particular thing. This is just... If you search for chicken art or chicken paintings on Etsy, 
you get a ton of original art. They're often small pieces, but they're really, really nicely done by independent artists. And I found plenty of them under $50. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, I'm going to end the night with the ultimate gift for a chicken lover who is a teen or an adult. And it is the game Chicken Challengers. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Chicken Challengers. (laughs) You're at the beach. Chicken Challengers. Wine with friends. Chicken Challengers. This game is still out there. It's an amazing card game, and it's all about chickens. And It has buff Orpingtons. (laughs) And they're buff. (laughs) And they're buff. So... It's a great family night. If you're all into chickens, you can play the card game together. That is my final pick because who can go wrong with a game and it's about chickens? You cannot go wrong with chicken challengers. There's no, you can't. No. You just can't. No, it's a classic. It is. Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are spotlighting a beautiful little European breed, the Frisian Gull. Oh, yeah. Main topic. We have the incomparable Fiona the Floof Lady joining us to talk about soft tissue injury in your chicken. Welcome back, fabulous Fiona. Cracking the eggs. We're back to holly recipes because we're doing a spiced pear tart. (laughs) No leftovers next week. No leftovers now. And retail therapy, we're doing our 2023 picks for chicken Christmas ornaments. And there's a lot of them. A lot of good ones. A lot of good ones. Okay. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.